Hey, what's up, GRE lovers? Today we are going to look into a critical reasoning passage and we are trying to resolve a paradox. So before jumping into this, I think we need a firm understanding of what a paradox is. And before that, if I move down, I've done some analysis here, we need to understand what a valid deductive argument is because the paradox is not a valid deductive argument. So let's try to understand what a deductive argument basically means. So if you have some type of philosophical training, this might not be very new information to you. So it is the case that there is premise one, there is premise two, and there can be more premises, but the conclusion basically follows the premise one and the premise two. For example, I can say all dogs are mammals, and since Jackie is a dog, therefore Jackie is a mammal. So in normal deductive arguments, you start with a general uh, statement, and then you try to come up with a specific one, which is like Jackie is a specific a name related to a dog, and then you try to combine them, you add them to come up even a more specific conclusion which is the fact that Jackie is a mammal. Another way we can actually understand or visualize this is probably using Venn diagrams. So what I can do here is, okay, let's come up with a shape. Okay, so if this huge rectangular box represents uh, mammals, and let's use another color, another shape, okay. And let's say this right here is the dogs. And if Jackie is inside the circle of the dogs, therefore it must be the case that Jackie is also a mammal. Since I just said that all mammals, all dogs are mammals, and since Jackie is a dog, therefore Jackie must be a mammal. So it's almost like there is a funnel in which you start from general, in which we were talking about uh, mammals, and then you come up with more specific information, which is about dogs, and then you try to combine them to come up with a laser-sharp conclusion, which is the fact that Jackie must also be a mammal. <coughs> so this is how basically simple deduction works. However, what we're trying to understand is the paradoxes, which is basically an invalid deductive argument. And let's try to understand them. So there are two premises, premise one, premise two, there can be more. But the problem is that the conclusion does not simply follow. And if I want to represent it with a graphical representation first, I can use two shapes, okay. Here's, oops, sorry. Made a mistake there, okay. I can say, yeah, this might be the one. So there are two premises, premise one, and there another, premise two. And the problem is that these two have basically no connection for getting the overlap. Like here, the fact that D exists inside of M, which is mammals, so basically, dogs was a subset of M. Therefore, we were able to conclude that Jackie must be a mammal. However, there are two different premises which have no link. Therefore, we cannot come up with any conclusion, right? So a good example would be when it comes to experience in driving, Greg is a lot, uh, has a lot of experience than Harris, right? However, when they race, Harris wins. Now, wait a minute. You might be like, what? What is going on here? If Greg is much more experienced in driving than what just happened when they were racing and it was a car race, how come Harris won? This is a simple example of two premises in which they are not linked with one another and you're just confused about the calculation or about the conclusion. So the question is, how do we resolve a paradox, right? Because the question is about resolving a paradox. 
Well, an easier way to do it is probably an, you add a value to the winning side, which in this case is Harris. And how I can add a value keeping in the context of uh, experience in driving and car race, well, I can say, you know what? Even though Greg is much more experienced driver, but the reason why Greg failed to compete against Harris in a car race is because Harris knew a shortcut, right? All am I doing is while keeping in the context, I am adding a value to the winning side. Or I can do basically the opposite. I can remove a value from Greg, and I can say, you know what, even though Greg is much more experienced driver than Harris, but when they race, but when they raced, the reason why Greg failed was because Greg's tire got flat, or probably a dog came in his way and he had to, because he was driving really fast, and therefore he, you know, just turned quickly and probably got into a car accident, etc., etc. So this is how you can basically resolve a paradox by adding a value to the winning side or subtracting a value from the losing side. Another example that I can give quite similar to that is, well, yeah, there's more. I can say, keeping the subject same, I can say, you know what, when it comes to the size, you know, the size, Greg is much more bigger and larger and taller than Harris. But when they had a wrestling match, a wrestling match, you know what? Harris won. Now, this doesn't seem to make sense. How can a huge guy lose a wrestling match with a tiny guy, right? This is like utter confusion. One way I can resolve this is saying that, you know what, even though Harris was quite small in size, Harris was a third degree black belt, you know? And because of his skill, he was able to take out a huge guy. Or probably I can say, you know, he was uh, he was a master of capoeira or Krav Maga or other martial, uh, martial arts, right? Something to this effect. Or I can remove a value from Greg's side and say, you know what, even though Greg is a huge guy, but the reason why he lost a match in wrestling uh, with Harris is because, you know what, probably his ankle got twisted or probably, you know, uh, you know, uh, probably he was not in his full form before the match. He kind of do like 100 push-ups and he was not in his full form, etc., etc. So basically, this is how you kind of like resolve a paradox. And now that we have a, some basic understanding of what a paradox is and how we can resolve it, I think we are in a pretty good condition in coming to the question and start solving it. Okay, so here we go. During the day in the lake, constant, the zooplankton D, I'm just going to call it D. H, okay, so I'm gonna be like, okay, during the day in the Lake Constant, the, the zooplankton DH departs for the depths where the water, where the food is scarce and the water is cold. Okay, so we need to visualize and try be able to imagine what is going on. So I'm gonna be like, okay, so here is the surface of the water and here is this clean looking sun, nice and shiny, and probably here is the surface, okay? So it says that DH departs for the depths. So probably DH is lying way down here. It's chilling right here, right? And it gives me two constraints where, yeah, food is scarce. Okay, food is really low. And what was the next one? Uh, yeah, the water is cold. So the temperature is also very low. Poor guy. Okay, probably he's allergic from the sun. I don't know. Okay, moving on. And... Then it says DG, I'm going to call it DG, okay, DG, remains near the surface where food is abundant, okay, where, the f where it is warm and the food is abundant. Okay, so DG is chilling over here and there is a lot of food and temperature is warm and he's kind of like enjoying it. Okay, so far so good. Even though DG grows and reproduces much faster, its population is often outnumbered by DH. Okay, so there is a lot of information. We need to break it down. So it says, uh, even though DG grows 
and reproduces much faster. So when you're talking about the reproduction rate or reproduction, uh, probably birth growth or whatever you want to call it. So DG is much faster or has a higher rate of reproduction than DH, right? But then it says its population is D. G's population is often outnumbered by DH. And when you're talking about the population, the population, DG, however, is outnumbered or DH is way more than DG. So if you consider this analysis, I think it is trying to resemble or it looks like a lot what we did in our example number two. You see right here. So all we need to do is in order to resolve a paradox is add a value to dh or subtract a value from dg. So how can I add a value to dh, those guys which are at the bottom? I can say, you know what, they're quite tough and they're resilient and, you know, they don't really need a lot of food. Or probably I can say that they have a longer lifespan, lifespan, something to this effect, okay? I can remove value from DG who are at the surface, you know. I can say, you know what, uh, even though they're at the surface, they have access to all these cool stuff, but you know what, people love to fish for them. And they, you know, just simply, you know, use food to catch them. Oh, uh, sorry, this is an ad, probably been a mistake here. Yeah, so we are subtracting a value, okay. So the way we can say that, you know what, the reason why there's a lot of food is people are probably, you know, they're all fishermen, they're just throwing this food and they're trying to grab this DG. Probably I can say, you know what, there's some chemical that is floating on the surface and it is killing the DG. Probably there's a nearby industry, who knows. Or I can say that, you know what, they're probably allergic to sun and they cannot handle sun radiation, etc., etc. So now that we are done with our initial analysis, now we can jump to the answer choice and, and start eliminating the wrong answer. So if I say DG produces twice as many offsprings per individual in, given, in any given period of time as DG. So it says that when it comes to producing offsprings, reproduction rate, DG, okay, DG, uh, twice, okay, DG produces twice as many, so DG is a lot more than DH. So this option is adding a value to DG and subtracting a value to DH. And probably in our analysis, we need to add a value to DH and remove a value to DG. And it is doing the opposite, as you can see here. And this is pr probably increasing the paradox. It is not helping us. I need to remove a value from DG, not in add in. Okay, so I can remove, I can uh, throw it away and cancel that. The next. DG clusters under vegetation during the hottest part of the day to avoid sun rays. So it's saying that, you know, DG has some type of this supportive defense mechanism and it can use it to protect itself. Again, in my analysis, I am trying to remove a value from DG and it is adding a value to DG. Again, it is not helping. It is increasing the paradox. C, in order to make the most of the scarce food resources, DH matures uh, more slowly than DG. So when, it, when you're talking about maturity, DH is a lot slower, more slower than DG. Okay, again, they, they're trying to add a value to DG and subtract a value from DH, and this is not what I want. It is doing the opposite and increasing the paradox. I can easily cancel it. B, predators of the zooplankton, such as the white fish and merch, live and feed near the surface. Okay, so who are at the surface? We have DG, okay, of the lake during the day. So if there are a lot of predators that are eating DG, then I am removing a value from DG, and remember my initial guess was something to like that there are a lot of 
fishermen who want to fish, probably chemicals are trying to kill them, probably sun is trying to kill them. And the answer choice just replaced it with the predators. So this option looks pretty good. I'm going to keep it, okay? A, the number of species of zooplankton living at the bottom, bottom means DH, of the lake is twice that of species at the surface. So DH, okay, so the number of species of zooplankton at the bottom to the lake is twice. There are more than the species living at the, at the, there are more than the species living at the surface, which is DG. Again, they are trying to add a value to, again, they're, uh, probably they're saying probably the same thing, right? That the population of DH is more than DG. And uh, is this helping me? It is probably saying the same thing, right? Uh, this is probably already given us right over here, right? So this is not helping me. So the only thing which makes sense is answer choice B. Uh, okay, guys, I think the main concern of this video was to describe one little thing, that if you have a neat process, then you don't really need to worry about the score and getting the answers correct. So if you have a neat process, if you have good GRE skills, then I can almost guarantee you that you don't have to worry about the score. Okay, guys, this is it for now, and I'll talk to you guys later.